Very good question. The question again being, do you think they study Native Americans in every state in the Union in their history classes? I'm probably briefly, whatever's in the textbook. But you're kind of in the middle of where this happens with Fort Fetterman and the Battle of the Bighorn, so I, I think we get more. So the overall topic is the military campaign of 1876, and the first subtopic then is the emergence of George Armstrong Custer. And I will tell you also, kids, this is not information you're going to find in a textbook. This information is very similar to the Honors U.S. History class on the Kennedy years. This comes from years of research, not from any textbook. Okay? Lots of study. So this information you're getting today is not something everybody's going to get. Now, remember they abandoned the forts along the Bozeman Trail. Remember Fort Phil Kearney was one that was abandoned and then was burnt down by which, which uh, Indian, Cheyenne Indians. Well, that didn't mean that the conflicts between the Plains Indians and the United States military ceased just because they you know, got rid of the forts. Now, one such conflict between Native Americans, Plains Indians, and the United States military occurred during the summer of 1874. 1874. And it happened in... Hoyt's kind of old neck of the woods happened in the Black Hills in South Dakota. Anybody know what happened in the Black Hills in South Dakota about 1874? Hoyt, you know this. What, what, what was discovered? Gold. gold. Bunches of gold, so to speak, was discovered in the Black Hills in that time. And General George Armstrong Custer commanded a military expedition to the Black Hills in present-day South Dakota because the military and the United States government had some interest in that area because of the gold discovery. So in the summer of 1874, after gold had been discovered on Sioux land in the Black Hills, General George Armstrong Custer commanded a military expedition there which is in present-day South Dakota. So again, summer of 1874, after gold had been discovered in the Black Hills, which was Sioux land, General George Armstrong Custer commanded a military expedition there to present-day South Dakota. Now, George Armstrong Custer was a guy that liked the media. He was a very, uh, in a way, arrogant guy, and he liked publicity. And so he always brought a newspaper correspondent with him on an expedition. And during this expedition, he told the newspaper correspondents that he had with him that, quote, gold was so plentiful you could pick it up off the ground. That's how much gold was in the Black Hills. It was not something that you could, uh, had, to, had to spend a lot of time getting. It was very, very plentiful. Okay? So during this expedition, Custer told reporters that had accompanied him on the trip, he said, quote, gold was so plentiful you could pick it up off the ground. How are you doing there, Josh? Got anything written down yet? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Now, initially, who's the president of the United States in 1874? We didn't talk a lot about him, but we told you a profile on him. Ulysses S. Grant, okay? And when Grant found out about gold in the Black Hills, he did try to purchase the Black Hills from the Sioux. He made an effort to try to purchase the Black Hills. Well, the Sioux weren't stupid. They knew that gold was in that area. So what do you think they did? He it? Well, not necessarily, because they weren't gold miners. That wasn't something that, uh, you know, they were interested in. But let's back up. Why did Grant even offer to buy that from the Sioux? So well, remember, it's after the Civil War. We're in pretty bad financial shape, and the nation needed the gold to kind of replenish its treasury. Okay? So Grant made an effort to try to purchase the land from the Sioux. Now, Garrett, why do you think, what do you think the Sioux did that didn't make it? Yeah, the Sioux, uh, Sioux Chief Sitting Bull put such a high price on the land that the United States couldn't afford to purchase it. So they weren't stupid. They weren't interested in mining the gold because that wasn't their thing. But they weren't going to give it to the government for nothing, so to speak. So probably a mistake that Chief Sitting Bull put a high price on the land, such a high price that the United States could not purchase the area. 
So, since their offer to purchase the Black Hills was rejected, what did Grant do? For like, sent the military. Sent the military in to take it. Okay? So, since their offer to purchase the Black Hills was rejected, the United States Army was ordered to take the sacred area from the Sioux. Now, somebody had to convince President Grant to do that. Who do you think were the people that sat down with President Grant and said, you know what, this Indian problem needs to have a solution once and for all. We're sick of this situation, we're tired of it. So who were the people that sat down with Grant, two individuals that he trusted? Sherman and Philip Sheridan. Generals William Sherman and Philip Sheridan. They're on your ID sheet. We talked about it before, but I put them back on there because it's a little different significance in this particular test material. So by 1876, before this campaign started, Generals Sherman and Sheridan sat down with President Grant and said, hey, this Indian problem we have in the West needs to be solved once and for all. We get the Indian problem solved, we don't have to worry about the Black Hills, we don't have to worry about the trails and the harassment going westward. We just need to solve this problem. So when Grant agreed with Sherman and, Fe and Sheridan, that they needed to solve the Indian problem, they began to make military preparations to solve the problem. Okay? So again, by 1876, Civil War Generals William Sherman and Philip Sheridan convinced President Grant that the Indian problem needed to be ended once and for all. And as a result, the federal government began to make military preparations to solve the Indian problem. Now, they just, with no warning, just go in and take it? No. No, what did they do? What did the government do? Uh, no? They gave them a chance. Well, they, they told, told them that they didn't sell to Yeah. What's that? They told them they didn't sell to Very good. They gave, an, gave them an ultimatum. Okay, and here's the ultimatum. Okay? The United States government gave the Plains Indians, the Sioux, an ultimatum. And it, just as Jacob said, you do this or this is going to happen. That's an ultimatum. Okay? You either behave yourself when I'm gone Friday or I will crush you on Tuesday. That's an ultimatum. Okay? You might not like the ultimatum, but that's what it is. Now, the ultimatum was this. The Plains Indians were to return to reservations by January 31st, 1876. The ultimatum was that the Plains Indians were to return to the reservations by January 31st, 1876. That was the ultimatum, first part of it. Plains Indians are to return to reservations by January 31st, 1876, or else. That's kind of what an ultimatum is, right? So the Plains Indians were to return to reservations by January 31st, 1876, or what? And the or what was, if they did not, they would be declared hostile by the government. So, the government, of, the government of the United States sent this ultimatum to the Plains Indians. They were told that they did not return to the reservations by January 31st, 1876. They would be declared, quote, hostile by the government. So the ones that choose to go... Okay. okay, the ones that choose not to will be deemed hostile. Now, the Plains Indians didn't even respond to this ultimatum for two reasons. They didn't even respond. They didn't even say yes or no. So they get the ultimatum and they don't even respond for two reasons. What time of the year is that, number Winter. one? Winter. What type of people are they? No, nomadic. Nomadic, yeah. They move from place to place. Well, if I told you... Well, if you were applying for a new job, would you be interested in moving out or moving into your new home in the middle of the winter? No, that would stink. And that was a problem. It was winter, and the Indians were not going to move from their villages to the reservation at that time of the year. So that's one reason why they didn't even respond to this ultimatum. It was the middle of the winter, and they did not want to move their villages from one place to another in the middle of the winter. That would be difficult. When's the last time they were forced to move in the middle of the winter? Trail, Trail of Tears. Very good. And what happened to them? Not that one. Yeah, Not well. So anyway, they wouldn't do it. Now, that's part of the story. The second reason they didn't respond to the ultimatum, which is probably more true, is they didn't even get the correspondence from the government. 
they gave him the ultimatum, but they never really got it to him. They just kind of made it publicly, and they didn't get it. And that's probably more true. So more, more, more uh, problematic is the fact that the Indians probably didn't even receive the ultimatum. If you don't receive the ultimatum, you don't respond to it, right? And that's probably more accurate than the other, to be honest with you. Well, because they didn't respond and their, quote, lack of cooperation, the Plains Indians as a whole were deemed hostile. Okay? Again, because of their, quote, lack of cooperation and the fact they didn't respond to the ultimatum, the Plains Indians were deemed by the military as hostile. And they made plans to deal with the hostiles. Okay? So again, because of the lack of cooperation on the part of the Plains Indians and the fact that they did not respond to the ultimatum, they were deemed hostile, and the United States military prepared plans to deal with hostiles. What was the name of the plan they had to deal with the hostiles? The Military Campaign of 1876. This whole military campaign is based on this premise that they did not respond to the ultimatum. So that's why we have a military campaign of 1876. Now, Obviously, one of the key players in this is George Armstrong Custer. And I think to understand this entirely, we need to have a profile of George Armstrong Custer and tell you a little bit about the guy. I mean, you know in history, at least in a little bit, you know that he went to a little big horn and got crushed, right? Killed everybody dead, etc. Okay? So what about, who would, what's this guy like that did that? Okay? So a profile of George Armstrong Custer is in order. Now, George Armstrong Custer was born on December 5th, 1839, in New Rumley, Ohio, which is on your ID sheet. Okay? George Armstrong Custer was born on December 5th, 1839, in New Rumley, Ohio. He was born on December 5th, 1839 in New Rumley, Ohio. Now during the time that he was a boy, his family moved from New Rumley, Ohio to Monroe, Michigan. Just like it sounds. Monroe, Michigan. Okay? So during his boyhood, the Custer family moved from New Rumley, Ohio to Monroe, Michigan. Now, when you looked at the Custer family, they were not people of importance, either politically or socially, either one. But they were of sound and respectable character. They were a good, solid, wholesome family. But they were not people of importance. They weren't politically tied to anything or socially. They were pretty normal people, the average people, who were of great integrity, they had good character, sound and respectable character. Okay. So George Custer moves there as a boy, he goes through elementary school, he goes through high school, and after his graduation from high school, he enrolls at the Military Academy at West Point. Okay? So after high school, George Custer enrolls at the prestigious Military Academy at West Point. Again, after high school, Custer enrolls at the Military Academy at West Point. And he graduates from West Point in June of 1861. He graduates from West Point in June of 1861. Anybody guess how well, did he have a good career at West Point? Good, good man? Awesome. Very good. He actually ranked last in his class after graduating from West Point. Last. Okay? And he actually received more demerits than anyone in the history of West Point to that far point. And he held the record for a while. Maybe he still does. So he was last in his class, and he accumulated the most demerits ever issued in the history of, of West Point. What year did he graduate? 1861. June of 1861. Demerits. You know what demerit is? It's a fancy word for saying, okay, uh, 
Anna, you didn't turn your paper on time. I'm going to give you a demerit. They kept track how many demerits you had, you know, how many times you got in trouble. It's kind of like your discipline file in the office. That'd be demerits, okay? Your behavior file. Now, he, he, he graduated in June of 1861, ranked last in his class, received the most demerits ever issued in the history of West Point, and even got punished after graduation, okay? He, he kind of refused to break up a fight. He encouraged the people to continue to fight after he graduated. But it was after he graduated and before he was given his military assignment. So when you graduate from West Point, they give you a military assignment, just like they did Grant. Remember, where'd he go? Oregon Territory, remember? Well, Custer hadn't even got his military assignment yet, and he got in trouble again, and it delayed his assignment. Okay? He didn't get the good assignment that he would have got. Yeah? Maybe. We'll see. Okay? So again, Custer was punished again after graduation. He, did, he failed to break up a fight between two cadets. He encouraged them to fight, and he was detained for assignment by the military because of it. In other words, he got a, supposedly a crappier assignment, okay? Actually, it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to him because you know who he got assigned to? Late General George McClellan. You remember McClellan in the Civil War. So Custer got a break and he ended up getting assigned to General George McClellan, which at the time appeared to be not such a great assignment, but for Custer it was a very good assignment. So Custer was detained for assignment by the military. His delay in receiving his military assignment paved the way for him to be placed under the command of General George McClellan. When? What's the year? June 1861? Who does he serve under? McClellan? When? Civil War. So Custer will serve under George McClellan during the Civil War. Now, with McClellan's mentorship and some discipline, Custer saw great success, and he earned a reputation as a fearless aggressor in the Civil War. He did a very good job under McClellan, was not afraid to put himself in a position on the offensive, and was never a coward, so to speak. I mean, even the opposite. He was very much forthworth in taking his men into battle, first one in line to charge. Didn't send his men in first, he led them into battle. And because of his great success, under McClellan, in 1863, at just the age of 23, he was promoted to Brigadier, Brigadier General. Do you remember, um, what's I-E-R? Do you remember in the movie Blue and the Gray when Malachi got scared and ran off, but he brought in the prisoners, and they promoted him right away, just like that, and gave him a battlefield promotion? Well, Custer was doing so well under McClellan over those two years from 1861 to 1863 during the Civil War, showing you know, fearlessness and, and leading the charge of being aggressive, that he was promoted to Brigadier General at the age of 23 in 1863. Custer actually fought at Gettysburg, and he led the Michigan Cavalry, which was in his command, headlong into Confederate forces on a charge, which turned the tide of the Battle of Gettysburg. So he even served at Gettysburg. He led the Michigan Cavalry, and his aggressive charge against Confederate lines helped turn the tide in favor of the Union. And because of that, in 1865, at the age of 26, he was promoted to Major General. Okay, so he's 26 years old, and he's a Major General in the United States Army because of his successes under McClellan in the Civil War from 1861 to 1860. When was he promoted? In 1865. He's just 26 years old. So he has made a great career for himself thus far. Done a tremendous job. He was actually present when Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox. He was there. He was invited to the surrender. That's how much in regard he was in the Union. He was a very, very successful Civil War leader. Very successful. Well, what expanded with his great success in the war? His ego. His ego. And he was referred to, as far as the, the media went, as the darling of the Northern Press, which is on your ID sheet. 
He was referred to by the media as the darling of the northern press. What does that mean, Jake? What does darling of the northern press mean? Did they like him or not like him? They found him interesting. They covered him a ton because he gave them good stories. So he was very media friendly. When I mentioned, he always took somebody from the media with him, a reporter, when he went on an expedition. So Custer's ego expanded during the war, and he was often referred to as the darling of the northern press. All the northern newspapers loved him, just loved and loved to write about him. Well, after the Civil War, he got married. He married a young lady by the name of Elizabeth Bacon. She was better known as Libby Custer. Not Elizabeth, but Libby. That was her nickname and better known. So Custer marries a young lady by the name of Elizabeth Bacon, better known to friends and family, and in general as Libby Bacon. And she was a very wealthy, she came from a very wealthy family, had standards, had protocol, and Custer kind of screwed up one night when he was court. Okay? In those days, the courting business was a lot different. You didn't, you know, now you guys ask each other out for a date. You don't ask, usually don't ask the father if you can take the girl out. Maybe you might even sneak her out the back window. I don't know. But in those days, it was a lot different story. When you started courting a girl, you were making intentions to marry her. And so you had to do everything just proper. Well, while he was courting Elizabeth, he became very drunk one night. Tried to get her attention, went to the bottom of her bedroom window and, and threw rocks up at her window, not breaking the window, but small rocks to try to get her attention. Okay? So he got all drunk up one night and he was trying to get her attention. He went to the bottom of her bedroom and threw pebbles up, hitting the window, trying to get her attention. And she was not happy. She chastised him for his inappropriate behavior and almost said, I've had enough of you. Yeah. So what Custer did from that point on in his life is what? Never drank again. Okay? Never took another drink. He, or I shouldn't say that. He took an oath never to drink again and followed it almost into its entirety. Okay? I'm not saying he never took a drink from that point on, but if he did, it wasn't very you know, it wasn't public. Okay? So he basically took an oath never to drink again because he almost lost Libby with his inappropriate behavior. Now, as much as this might seem, and maybe girls like this and boys don't, I don't know. But Custer's relationship with his wife was an incredible, great relationship. They loved each other, adored each other. It was a very in-love relationship. There was never a time that I don't think they quarreled much. Uh, they had great admiration for each other. They treated each other with great respect. And in a day when the man kind of expected the woman, you know, to, to be his, he was a superior, Custer never treated Libby like that. They were, it was a really great marriage and great relationship. Very, very good. And the reason that probably was is because family was so important to Custer. And I'll tell you some of the people that were really important to him, okay? Here are some people who were very important to Custer. This would be other than Libby, obviously. His brothers, Tom and Boston Custer. I don't think I have them on your ID sheet. Tom and Boston Custer, his brothers. Very, very important to him. Tom and Boston. He also was very fond of his brother-in-law, a guy that married his sister. His name was James Calhoun, who it is on your sheet. So he's very fond of his brothers, Tom and Boston Custer. He was very fond of his brother-in-law, James Calhoun. And he was very fond of his nephew, Audie Reed. Yeah. So the name Calhoun sounds familiar. Okay. Well, it wasn't John C. John yeah, it wasn't relation, but it does sound, but it wasn't. So family was very important to Custer besides an incredibly great relationship with his wife, Libby. He was very close to brothers Tom and Boston. He was very close to his brother-in-law, James Calhoun, and he was very close to his nephew, Audie Reed. A little side note, all four perished with him at the Battle of the Little Big Horn. All four. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Well, after the Civil War, the Army dropped Custer's rank to captain. Okay, anybody know why? Why did they drop me? This guy did a hell of a job. Yeah, Why did they drop the Civil War, they were giving out promotions to raise morale. Absolutely. It was just, it's like Malachi got the one on the battlefield. They were promoting too many people too fast. And they had too many generals. You can't, it's like the old saying of not being derogatory, you can't have too many chiefs and not enough warriors. Okay? Everybody can't be telling everybody what to do. So Custer wasn't the only one. They busted down, so to speak, a lot of military leaders after the Civil War. And he was 
busted down, so to speak, to captain, okay? Because too many officers were promoted too quickly, okay? And uh, Caleb was exactly right. So anyway, Custer's back to a captain, and he's trying to decide what he's going to do. Well, in July of 1866, not long after the Civil War ended, in July of 1866, Congress passed a new law called the Army Act of 1866. And what that did is it formed the Frontier Army. So in July of 1866, Congress passed a law called the Army Act of 1866, which is on your ID sheet, and it formed an entire Frontier Army, an army that would patrol the frontier or the West to keep the peace between what? Native Americans and whites, okay? So in 1866, the Army Act of 1866 was passed, and it formed a frontier army. Now, it developed many regiments. There were many different companies of the frontier army, and the most famous was the 7th Cavalry, which is on your ID sheet. So there are many different cavalries, and we'll talk about that in different units, but the Frontier Army was made up of different cavalries. The most famous of the Frontier Army cavalries was the 7th Cavalry. And who assumed command of that in November of 1866? Custer. Okay. So in November of 1866, Custer arrived at Fort Riley in Kansas and assumed command of the infamous 7th Cavalry of the Frontier Army. So in November of 1866, Custer arrived at Fort Riley in Kansas, and he assumed the command of the 7th Cavalry. Now, when Custer got there, the 7th Cavalry wasn't exactly in tip-top shape. There were three reasons why the 7th Cavalry was in poor condition, and it will be Custer's job to whip him into shape. Okay, but here are the three reasons why the 7th Cavalry was in very poor condition, borderline pitiful when he got there. Okay? What can you think? Why would that... Okay, he's, he, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming the 7th Cavalry. Here's the 7th Cavalry right here. What might be the type of people I might be assuming when I go in there? Scared and like wandering around waiting for them. Not so much that. You're good. But not so much that. You're guessing good, though. Think. What type of people might, that's going to make it a poor cavalry might be in the army? Not very well Um, no. Young. No. What? Who helped us in the Civil War a little bit? Blacks. Okay, who else helped us? Who helped the South a little bit? Indians. No. <laughs> foreigners. Okay, and we had a lot of foreigners that stayed here after the Civil War, and what did they, they had nothing to do, so what did they do? Join the Army. So the first reason why the 7th Cavalry was in tough shape is because the cavalry had an abundance of foreign soldiers. Some that couldn't even speak English. We're going to talk about one called Giovanni Martini later in the Custer Battle. Okay, that comes to mind. But anyway, there were a lot of foreign soldiers. That's one reason why they were in tough shape. They didn't understand it. Secondly, believe it or not, the cavalry had a number of Confederate soldiers that had no place to go after the Civil War. Where are you going to go after you got defeated like they got defeated? The only thing they could do is the only thing they knew was the army, so they joined the Union Army, which was now the overall army, right? Because we're back to back in business. So it had a lot of Confederate soldiers, had no place else to go. What what would their attitude be for fighting? They're yeah, not good for fighting for the North, so to speak. They see still see it as the North, right? And then who else do you have? The officers that Custer inherited had what happened to them? Most of them. What happened to the officers after the Civil War, including Custer? Oh, they got demoted. So he had a bunch of unhappy, demoted military officers who were still mad over their demotion. So he walks into the 7th Cavalry. He's got a whole bunch of foreign people they don't, that don't understand English, most of them. He's got a bunch of Confederate soldiers that really don't want to be there, but they ain't got nothing else to do. And he's got a bunch of officers he's got to train that are mad because they got demoted after the Civil War. So he walked into a mess. And it's going to be his job of fixing this mess. And I'll just tell you right now, as a commander, Custer had a reputation of working his men very hard. He didn't screw around. And tomorrow I'll give you some examples of how tough he was on it. Okay? We're going to go from there. Any questions? Okay, you're doing good.